Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. season of Heart to Heart with Anna. Our theme this season is Carpe Diem, Seize the Day, and we have a great show today. The heart is a complicated organ, perhaps the most complicated organ in our body except for the brain. Like the brain, the heart has an electrical system, and when something goes haywire with that system, bad things can happen. Everyone has heard of athletes, even star athletes, suddenly falling down while running into everyone's horror, the person a seemingly extremely healthy individual passing away. According to the SADS, or Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndrome website, each year in the United States, 350,000 Americans die suddenly and unexpectedly due to cardiac arrhythmias. Almost 4,000 of them are young people under age 35. 10 to 12 percent of sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS, cases are due to long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome, or LQTS, is now known to be three times more common in the United States than childhood leukemia. One in 200,000 high school athletes in the United States will die suddenly, most without any prior symptoms. We in the heart community have been working hard to bring awareness to congenital heart defects, the number one birth defect. But electrical problems in the heart must also be talked about, not just structural problems in the heart, or else we miss the opportunity to save thousands of lives. Today's show is Seizing the Day with Jackie Renfro. Jackie Renfro is a mother, a wife, and a grandmother who works full-time. Members of her family had been diagnosed with epilepsy. On April 15, 2000, Jackie received a phone call that her son Jimmy was having a seizure. Sadly, Jimmy didn't survive the seizure. His 17-year-old daughter was only two years old when he died. Jackie worried that there was something wrong with her daughter, Chrissy, too, so she asked the doctors to test her. Nothing was found, and Chrissy became pregnant with her daughter, Jessica, who was born November 23, 2001. After giving birth, Chrissy began having seizures. On July 25, 2002, Chrissy was rushed to the hospital having a seizure. She didn't survive and passed away at the young age of 21, and Jessica was only eight months old, but now she is 14 years old. In May 2002, Jackie's mother was rushed to the hospital due to fainting spells and rapid heartbeat. Finally, at the age of 73, doctors discovered the family had an inherited heart condition known as long QT syndrome. And today, we have Jackie on the show with us. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, Jackie. Hi, Anna. Thank you so much for having me today. Well, I'm delighted to have you on the show, Jackie, and I'm so, so sorry for the loss of your two precious children. I just can't even imagine losing two children to an unknown, to you at that time, heart defect. It must have been so heartbreaking. Yes, it's very tragic. It forever changes your life. It's something that you never get over. You just learn to deal Mm -hmm. with. Right. But despite that, You agreed to come on the show, and our theme this season is Seize the Day. And I'm wondering, how can you seize the day after suffering so many tragic losses? Well, I do believe that I was left here on this earth for a reason, and it was to help raise awareness to save other people's lives. I was not aware that having a seizure was connected to the heart. And thank heavens that I do have two grandchildren and a wonderful husband and my mom and my siblings and a great job, so I'm very thankful to have that, and I just have to make the most out of every day. Absolutely, and I like what you said about the fact that you feel that you have a purpose in this life, and maybe it's to help other families who have long QT syndrome or who have some kind of problem that doctors aren't identifying properly. How did you feel when you discovered through your mother that your children most likely also had long QT syndrome, and that's what caused them to die. Well, as you can imagine, I was very sad because after living with this for 43 years, I find 10 months after my daughter had passed away and two and a half years after my son passed away, we find the missing 
piece to the puzzle, Mm -hmm. and it was the heart. Unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of awareness. Okay, maybe no awareness. I had never heard of a a defibrillator before, and you didn't hear a lot about CPR. So the heart just never occurred to me that that would cause a seizure. It always seemed that when someone had a seizure, it was related to the brain. Right, right. Definitely, that's what I would think, except that we do hear about athletes who all of a sudden pass away very quickly, and that's what happened with both Chrissy and Jimmy, right? That's correct. They were both in their sleep. And with the type of long QT, they're currently doing research on my blood at this time, but they're thinking along the lines that we have type 2 long QT, and this commonly will kill you in your sleep experiencing a seizure. But unfortunately, the saddest part of when I found out what we had was that I could not bring my kids back and they could have been treated. It wasn't like a terminal cancer or a tragic car accident where there was absolutely nothing you could do. It could have been prevented. It absolutely and could I, have. You're lucky with your mom that she actually exhibited symptoms. It doesn't sound to me like either Chrissy or Jimmy actually had any symptoms. Is that true? No, they both had symptoms. Chrissy Chrissy had more symptoms, and it seems that females probably do because we have so many different changes in our body with puberty, menstrual cycles, and then childbirth takes a big toll on your body. It changes your electrolytes. It throws all your nutritional intake off so you're more prone to have an episode after having a child, not while you're pregnant, but after. Mm. So what's I was very worried that maybe some of our listeners who are questioning whether or not there is something wrong with someone in their family, can you tell us about the symptoms or the red flags that now you know, oh my goodness, that is associated with long QT syndrome? Well, we always had experienced rapid heartbeat. We thought we all had bad nerves, but we would have seizures. If we got excited about something years ago, probably back in the 60s, my mom, she had a phone in her room and we would have to cover the phone with pillows because when the phone would ring, it would startle her and anything that startles you will cause you to have a seizure. So it's very important to try not to go up behind someone and even play pickaboo or something with a young child because it has been known to kill children before. Mm -hmm. So Like I was saying back in the 60s, we would have to cover the phone with pillows so if someone did call, then it would muffle the sound and it wouldn't cause mom to have a seizure. Wow. Okay, so you all had the seizures fairly regularly, and I guess during the seizure, would the heart beat extra fast during the seizure? Yes, it usually did, but of course we weren't aware of that. But anything that would startle us, my first seizure actually was I was running down the street. I was upset. There was an argument going on at our home, you know, just siblings fighting. And I was running to a neighbor's home, and I was running as fast as I could. I was only six years old, and I ran into a rose bush having a seizure. Oh, my goodness. That must have been so frightening for you. Well, it was very frightening, and of course... Back then, we were automatically labeled as epileptics, and then I was immediately put on medication because my mom and my sister both were on the medication for seizures. Wow. And were Chrissy and Jimmy also on seizure medication? Yes, they were. But Jimmy and Chrissy were on a different type of seizure medication as I was. I was treated with Dilantin and phenobarbital. Most of my family was treated with Dilantin. We have found some research recently stating that that could possibly help long QT. It's in the research study right now, but they're thinking that that can serve as a beta blocker as well. But Jimmy and Chrissy were on Tegretol, which absolutely did nothing for the heart. Oh, wow. So do you also have long QT syndrome, Jackie? Yes, I do. Yes, I have long QT, and both of my grandchildren have it. So I have a very strong gene. I think I was the youngest one of my mother's four. I think the more children mom had, the stronger the gene had become. Your siblings also have long QT syndrome? Yes, all of them but one. I have three siblings, and my brother and my sister have it, and then I have one sister that does not have it. 
This is just amazing. And do your siblings have children as well? Yes, they do. My one sister, her daughter has long QT, and we're not really sure about if her son has it or not. But however, thankfully, her grandson does not have it. Wow. Has your entire family been tested? Not to the extent I would like it. I would like to see all of our family's blood taken and some extensive research on it. Because the one sister they'd done EKGs on her, I'm really not convinced that she doesn't have it. With long QT also, I would like to point out one other very important thing. Your medication you take can trigger it. You can have a recessive gene for long QT, and you can take, just say, for instance, a Benadryl, which is an antihistamine, and it will speed up your heart rate, and it can cause you to go into cardiac arrest. So you also have to be very cautious of the medication that you're taking. Over-the-counter medications. Yes, yeah, all medications, even antibiotics. Wow. That's really scary to think that you might have a headache and you might take something for the headache or you might feel congested and take something for your congestion and cause yourself to have an episode. So does anyone in your family have a pacemaker? All of us. We all have defibrillators, internal cardiac device, which Mm -hmm. would be better known as an ICD, and Mm -hmm. this has a pacemaker. It records all your activity of your heart, and it also has... The defibrillator, so if you do start going into cardiac arrest, it will revive you. Wow. It's so wonderful to know, though, that your family is now so much better protected. Had Chrissy and Jimmy had an ICD, they might still be with us today. Exactly. Yes, they would have been here today. It's very treatable. It could be very dangerous, of course, even with the device if you're driving down the street or something. But, yes, it's very preventable. You cannot get rid of it, but you can treat it. And that is a perfect note for us to go to a quick commercial break. This is something that can be treated. I like ending on a positive note. Don't leave yet, listeners, because coming up next, we're going to talk to Jackie about what obstacles she has faced in seizing the day and how her granddaughters are seizing the day after we come back from this short commercial break. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect or CHD community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Seizing the Day with Jackie Renfro. Jackie is a wife, a mother, and grandmother, and she has the most incredible family history I have ever heard of people with long QT syndrome. There is no doubt to me that this is a genetic problem just in talking to Jackie Renfro. I never heard so many people to be affected by it, but I'm so inspired by Jackie that her family has now discovered the problem that was causing them to lose their loved ones so early. And now here she is on the show promoting awareness. And Jackie, you just really startled me. I knew a little bit from your bio, but I had no idea how prevalent long QT syndrome was in your family. Well, yes, Anna, and we're actually tracking this back to the 1930s when my mother was only two years old. Her father was having suffocating spells. They would call them fits, of course, back then. And my grandma woke up to find him deceased also, and he had passed away in the evening, same way as my children. Oh, my goodness. So this is something that generations of your family has suffered with. Oh, yes, yes, and it's went on for years and years. It was just a part of our lives, our whole family having seizures. It was a scary part. It was nothing for us to call each other and say, Jimmy had a seizure, Chrissy had a seizure, Mom had a seizure. It just went on and on. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that you're here to spread some awareness and talking about some of the ways that we can now prevent these sudden death occurrences from happening in your family. 
this is just amazing that we, there are drugs that can help. There is the ICD or the implantable cardiac device that can help prevent a sudden cardiac death event from happening. Your family has suffered a lot of loss, especially your two granddaughters losing parents so early in their lives. Can you tell me what it is that your family does to help those girls to seize the day? I've just been very involved in their lives. I try to always share memories about their parents and what their parents were like because, of course, Alexis was two and Jessica was eight months old, so they have no recollection of their parents. I try to keep Jimmy and Chrissy's memory alive, showing them pictures, showing them videos, whatever I can do. Jessica's only 14, but Alexis has really become real curious of her dad. Now at 17 years old, she's getting ready to graduate and go on to college. Mm -hmm. Ironically, Alexis was very involved with the color guard, and she was out there performing just fine, and she had her defibrillator and her pacemaker, and she didn't miss a beat. Okay. So they've been able to have a relatively normal childhood growing up. They have because it was caught so early. Alexis was five years old when my mom was rushed to the hospital. Jessica was just a baby. She was 18 months old. So it wasn't actually discovered in Jessica till about five with the EKG. And Alexis began being treated at five with beta blockers. However, she did not get her defibrillator until she was 13 years old. And Alexis had experienced two seizures and was rushed to Riley Hospital in Indianapolis, Riley's Children's Hospital, and that's where she had even coded and they had to revive Alexis and then they put in a defibrillator the next day. Wow. So they were hopeful that they could treat her with the medication, but just having the medication on board wasn't enough. Correct, yes. Once they hit a certain age, the medication just is great and it helps them so much, but they really need that little extra boot with the pacemaker defibrillator. That's really good to know. So anybody who has a family history of sudden cardiac death, they should have their family tested, including their children, their grandchildren, their siblings, and just to be aware that while medication may help for a certain period of time, that having an implantable cardiac device might be what actually saves their lives. Exactly. And if nothing else, this device will record everything that's going on with your heart. So you will know if your heart's doing things that it shouldn't be doing, that maybe your beta blockers need increased or decreased off Mm -hmm. of what the recordings are. Mm -hmm. We actually have a transmitter that transmits to the hospitals where our doctors are, and then they can read it, and we go see electrophysiologists. It's not just cardiologists. It would be an electrical heart doctor. Right. And anybody who has arrhythmias that are of a serious nature would see an electrophysiologist. That's actually a new word (laughs) for a lot of people. That's a tongue twister, isn't it? Well, it can be. It's funny because I did a show with Dr. Wilson Lamb. And as I was writing his bio for the show, I thought, electrophysiologist, is that really a word? And I went and looked on the internet and I couldn't find it, but I knew it was a word because I wrote back to the doctor and I said, is this a real word or am I making something up? (laughs) Yeah, people kind of look at me every time I say that, like, how do you even remember that word? But it's embedded in my head. Everybody with a heart arrhythmia, I would advise them to see an electrophysiologist. Right. An electrophysiologist is somebody who is cardiology trained and on top of that is trained to specialize in the electrical system of the heart. And there is a lot to know about the electrical system of the heart. It's not something very simple. It takes a lot of years of study, I think, to be as brilliant as like Dr. Lamb was. If you haven't listened to his show, you really should listen to his show, Jackie. He's It's just brilliant. And I'm so impressed with how much we have learned about the heart because, like you said, just 20 years ago, we really didn't know that much. Yes, I didn't even know what a defibrillator was when my children passed away. I had no clue. When you are watching a show, you know, it'll say shock advised or stand back, they're going to get a shock. So, yeah, and you're seeing more and more defibrillators everywhere, and they should be out there just like fire extinguishers. Well, in the airports now, you see it says AED, and it has a symbol of the heart. So 
people see them, I want to be trained on how to use one because I've seen those boxes, but if I needed to access one real quickly, I'm not sure I would know what to do. Although I do think there are directions there, but that's not the time you want to stop and read directions. <laughs> you want to know. Actually, a defibrillator will talk to you once you open the lid or you press a button, whichever type you have. I know the cardiac science, you lift up the lid when you get the pads out and it immediately starts talking to you and instructing you exactly what to do. So there's people don't need to be afraid of a defibrillator. They're really user friendly. Wow, that is so good to know. Well, we do need to take another quick commercial break. Don't leave yet everyone. When we come back from the commercial, we'll be talking to Jackie about what advice she has for other families who have an inherited congenital heart defect about how they can seize the day and also how they can be advocates for themselves and their families. We'll be right back. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Seizing the Day with Jackie Renfro. Jackie is an amazing survivor. She has discovered that she and her family have an inherited congenital heart defect known as long QT syndrome. And she has just been teaching me all about long QT syndrome. And we've been talking about electrophysiologists and AEDs. And it's good to know that you don't need to be afraid. If you can get your hands on an AED, do it. It will most likely talk you through what the steps are that you need to take. And you too can save a life. It's just amazing to me how much I've learned about long QT syndrome and talking with you today, Jackie. So We only have a couple minutes left, Jackie, but I really want to know what advice you have for families who discover they have an inherited heart defect like what you have. How is it that they can learn about something this devastating and still seize the day, still make the most of every day they have? What advice do you have? Just appreciate every day you have with your family, your children, and if you have something that's treatable, be your own advocate. If a doctor tells you something, do your own research, and you don't have to necessarily just see one doctor. And also, I would like to add to that, Anna, that if someone has a child that's in sports, the exams that they give the children, they are not going to detect a heart condition. There are several hospitals I know here in Indianapolis that we have, well, we have a few of them, that will advertise heart screenings for student athletes for $25. Mm -hmm. Do some research and checkouts in your community if there are any hospitals that are offering this promotion or put it on your insurance because it's worth it to have your child alive. If they get out there and they're playing and they don't get the proper physical, you could be one of the statistics with your child laying out there on the field. Mm -hmm. I was shocked when I went out to the SADS website and I saw that one in 200,000 high school athletes will die suddenly without any prior symptoms. That's a terrifyingly large number, actually, when you think about how many athletes there are in the United States. And of course, this is not just simply a problem in the United States. That's just where I found some of the information. This is something that happens all across the world. Yes, it is. And so many people have lost their children to that. I am in contact with several people that have lost their children suddenly playing football, baseball, basketball in their sleep. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen regardless. But unless you have that child's heart checked, you are actually running the risk of this happening suddenly. And you only have so many minutes to get that blood flowing or it's going to cause some type of brain damage as well. Right. Everyone needs to know how to do CPR and use an automatic external defibrillator. I agree with you 100%. And in fact, I live in the state of Texas, and that has been a problem here in Texas with us having athletes that have sudden death happen to them. And because of that, there are a number of hospitals in Texas that will do free athlete screenings. And my older son, born 
quite healthy, but he had a little brother who had hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And I had read in families where one person had a left-sided heart defect, other family members often had undetected heart defects. So I was very concerned when my older son became a state swimmer and I didn't want the same kind of thing to happen to him, that he might all of a sudden have a seizure, like you're saying, or have something happen and he might drown in the water. It was something very frightening to me. So when I found out that they had free athlete screenings at one of the hospitals in Waco, I was the second person in line that day. We got there so early. I just That's I was awesome. So no, that is awesome. Yep, that's a great thing to do. As a parent, we have to be our own advocate with our children. We only, they are our children. It's our responsibility to make sure. And unfortunately, there's no state law to protect them, and I wish there were in all states. I do, too. That is something that we're going to need to probably work on, Jackie. We're going to have to get on a soapbox here. (laughs) Yes, we are. We have a lot of things to work on, Anna. Well, we do. I mean, this is something, especially when you have a family history where people have died suddenly, that's just so terrifying. And then to find out, oh my goodness, it's a genetic defect, but we don't have to give up hope. There is something very simple, taking a medicine or having a device implanted in you. What we can do about it is simple. We just have to be knowledgeable. And if we can spread that knowledge to others, we do have a chance to save a life and It gives you a sense of relief. But for you, just the opposite happened. For you, you found out that your mother had something different than what you thought. It wasn't epilepsy. In fact, it was a heart defect. And when you had members of your family tested, you found out you all had, or almost all of you, had that same defect. And like you said, if you didn't have it yourself, how is it that you could possibly have the recessive gene even if you didn't have it yourself? Is that right? That's true, yes. And then if you take the wrong medication, then it could very well cause you to go into cardiac arrest as well. If you suspect your child of having stuff, then do your research. We have the world's biggest dictionary called Google, and you can research (laughs) anything anymore. It's amazing what you can research, but I like what you said earlier in the show where you said, see the right specialist. This is not something that your primary care doctor is probably going to know that much about. You need to see a cardiologist, and if you do have a problem, you need to see an electrophysiologist. Those yes, are the you absolutely do. Right. Those are the specialists who will make sure you get the right medication, who make sure that they're following you. It's that follow-up care that is so important, don't you think, Jackie? Yes, absolutely. To me, I think, yes, you have to take matters into your own hands. I've heard so many times people saying, well, my doctor said, you know, they work for you. You pay them through your insurance company or out of your pocket, however it's done. They work for you, and if you need an answer, you don't stop until you get that answer. Because once the heart stops, you can't live without it. So, you know. You can't live without your heart beating. That is a certain <laughs> That's, yes. It does not happen, does it? We need the correct electrical impulse in the heart to make sure that things go smoothly. And so you're absolutely right. We do have to be our strongest advocate for ourselves and for our children and to teach our own children how to be an advocate for themselves. So Jackie, how often do you have to see a cardiologist? Twice a year. Mm -hmm. And so do both of my grandchildren. And luckily, both of my grandchildren go to Riley Hospital, which is well known, I believe, all over the country. And luckily, it's right here in Indianapolis. Very, very good hospital. It is a very good hospital. I've had a number of friends who have had children treated there, and I've heard nothing but good things about Barley Children's Hospital. So thank you so much for coming on the show today, Jackie. I feel like this has been a breakthrough show. This is the first show for Heart to Heart with Anna that we've done on Long QT Syndrome, but I don't think it'll be the last one because I think this is something we need to address. And I'll be talking about care for adults with congenital heart defects in one of our upcoming seasons. And Jackie, we're going to need to have you come back on the show then or one of your granddaughters to talk about the care for adults with long QT syndrome. Would you like to do that? I would love to do that, Anna. Thank you so much for having me today. Oh, well, it has been a delight. I have really enjoyed getting to know you. Unfortunately, that does conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thanks for listening today. Please come back 
next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern time. Until then, please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our website, hearttoheartwithanna.com and our Cafe Press Boutique. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and Spreaker. If you follow us on Spreaker, we can eventually petition iHeartRadio to carry the show on iHeartRadio. Then you would be able to tune in to Heart to Heart with Anna on the radio in your car. That would be really cool. Right now, you can hear us on the internet 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Please remember, my friends, to come back, like us, follow us, and remember, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week. Music.